Hello, good morning. This is Rick Pina, and I'm bringing you today's word for March 10th, 2023. I'm teaching a series on the miracles of Jesus. And thus far, we started in January, on January 2nd, I believe. And from January 2nd to now, we've been looking at a bunch of miracles. This is part 42 of the series. Um, something occurred to me in the miracle that we were looking at yesterday that is a common occurrence between three miracles of all the miracles that Jesus performed. There's something special about these three, and we're going to deal with that today. So this is the royal official son, part two. We looked at this yesterday. We're going to go back to it again today. And the title of today's mes message is how religion can interfere with your faith. I'm going to teach you about faith in such a way that I'm going to emphasize the fact that if you are very religious, if you're focused on religious practices, if you're not delivered from performance-based religion, how your emphasis on human performance and religious practices and tradition, how that can actually interfere with your faith. And God wants you to be free from that so you can open up your heart to receive on the level that God wants you to receive. I've told you this before, but if your level of expectation from God is based on your perceived level of performance towards God, then you will never be able to believe on God's level because God's goodness towards you exceeds your ability to be good. God's goodness towards you exceeds the level of your performance. You must decouple, detach, and disconnect your faith from your performance. Put in the chat, say, my faith is not performance-based. You got to be delivered from the limits of your performance so that you can be the man or the woman that God has called you to be. Man, this is going to be good, y'all. Get ready to receive. I'm so excited about this message. I was raised to be very religious, and it wasn't until I was delivered from performance-based religion that I was really able to open up my heart to believe on the level that God wants to, to use me to make an impact in this world that will not easily be erased. So you got to be delivered from performance-based religion. Say amen to that. All right. Psalms 126 and verse 4 is not about the miracle, but it's something that we need to cover. The Bible says, now, Lord, do it again. Come on, Lord, do it again. Restore us into the former glory. May streams of your refreshing flow over us until every dry area in our heart is drenched again. Put in the, in, in the chat, no dry places for me. I don't want any area of my life to be dry. I, I, I want to walk with God. I'm talking about fresh wind, fresh fire, fresh anointing, fresh favor. Then it needs to be a level of freshness as we're walking with God so that we can just have that zeal, that passion, that desire that we once had. Lord, do it again. All right. So let's look at this miracle again. We looked at this miracle, the royal official son yesterday. I want to go back to it again today. This is what the Bible says in John chapter four, verses 43 through 54. Now, after two days, he, Jesus, departed thence and went into Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet have no honor in his own country. Then when he was come into Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, because they were there at the feast as well. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he had turned water into wine. And there was a certain nobleman, a royal man, who's there, whose son was sick, but his son was back at Capernaum. That's over a day's journey away. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and he begged him that he would come down to Capernaum to heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Say serious situation. Then Jesus said unto him, except you see the signs and wonders, you guys are not going to believe. I'm kind of tired of having to go everywhere, doing every stuff, all these things in front of you so that you can believe. Uh, he says, the nobleman said unto him, but son, sir, please come. I need you to come down because if not, my son will die. Verse 50. So Jesus said unto him, go thy way. Thy son lives. Your son is healed. Don't even worry about it. Just go. I, I don't have to go all the way to Capernaum. I'm just going to speak the word of healing. Go. And the man believed Jesus and the man took him at his spoken word. And he went his way. And as he was going down, one of the servants from his house came out to meet him. And, and the servant said, your son is fine. Your son is healed. Your son is alive. Your son is good. 
And the man said, well, at what time was he healed? And he said, well, it was around 1 p.m. yesterday. And then the man realized that's exactly the time that Jesus said, your son is healed. So he and his whole household came to Jesus. Revival came to this man's house. His whole household was saved because of this miracle. So yesterday, I introduced you to the miracle and I taught you uh, certain things about it, about faith. But today I'm going to really kind of focus in on the fact that how religion can interfere with your faith. Now, what I'm about to share with you is something that dawned on me yesterday about three miracles that are, that are like miracles to this one. There's two other miracles that are like this one. And these three have something in common. I've never heard anybody point this out. I've never read it in any of the commentaries. So I'm not saying, look, I didn't get this from any scholars or anything like that. I'm just telling you what the Holy Spirit revealed to me about these three miracles. Now, whenever I'm teaching something that I've never heard anybody else say, and this happens from time to time, I, I want to I want to preface this by saying, look, I could be wrong, right? I, what I'm gonna I'm I, I'm just gonna give you what I believe God gave me, uh, but I'm not I'm not trying to be you know. Uh, um, I don't want to overstate anything, but I do believe that what the Holy Spirit revealed to me about these three miracles is significant and important. So as I get into these three, I want you to really open up your heart to receive. You ready? All right. So now what does this mean for you today? I have three things to share with you. I want you to open up your heart and get ready to receive. Let me teach this morning. I'm going to try to really do some teaching. You ready? All right, here we go. Number one, it is worth noting that Jesus only performed three miracles that involved non-Jews three miracles that involve non-Jews, and there's something special that all three have in common, which is what I'm going to present to you today. So these are three miracles where Jesus spoke something, and the people just received it and took Jesus at his word and walked away like it was already done without having to see the manifestation of it right before their very eyes. In other words, there were only three people that were willing to say, Jesus, speak the word only. And if you speak the word only, I believe and I receive it. There were only three people that believed God on that level, that believed the anointing on Jesus's life on that level and walked away like it was already done. There's only three. So we can learn something from these three. So of all the miracles that Jesus performed, there's only three occasions where he spoke healing or deliverance and the people had enough faith to believe and receive it and walked away like it was already done. Now, to be clear, Jesus himself had spoken things in faith and he walked away like it was already done. He spoke to a fig tree. He spoke nine words, no man shall eat fruit from thee hereafter forevermore, walked away like it was already done. And it wasn't until 24 hours later that the fig tree dried up, but he believed he received from the father. He spoke what he received from the father and he walked away like it was already done. And the next day when Peter was like, whoa, Jesus, this tree is dried up, just like you said, Jesus took it as an opportunity to teach an object lesson in faith. He said, have faith in God. He says, anyone who, who says to this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea or unto yonder place and shall not doubt in his heart, he shall receive whatsoever he saith. You're going you're gonna to have whatsoever you say when you believe and you receive from the Father and you say what the Father is telling you to say and you decree what God is telling you to decree. You're decreeing what you're, you're speaking. You're declaring what he's already decreed and you say it in faith without a doubt, without wavering. Do not doubt in your heart. You will have whatsoever he, you say. Now, Jesus did that. He spoke words of faith, but he never encountered anyone that just took him at his word except three people and the three people have something in common. So what do these three people have in common? All three were non-Jews. All three were Gentiles. All three were considered at the time to be non-religious people. So, so there's something significant about that that we should talk about. All three were people that were not raised under the system of the Judaic law. Now, to be clear, Jesus's primary ministry was to the Jews. The, the, the 95% of what he did in ministry for three and a half years was to Jews, not to Gentiles. You know, with the Syrophoenician woman, he even told her, look, it's not even right for me to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. So he was really focused on the Jews and not the Gentiles. But when he was dealing with the Jews, because they were raised under the system of the Judaic law, and because they were raised under the system of all of the rules associated with the law in Leviticus, then during his three and a half years 
of ministry, he was dealing with people that were raised under rites and rituals and routines and tradition. And so when he was dealing with them, a lot of times he had to kind of break through that in order to minister to them. And also too, they had to break through whatever their religious practices were to be able to receive from Jesus. Because remember, these were people that were raised to really look at the priest and the high priest as their intermediaries between God and man. And so when Jesus came as the ultimate high priest, then they didn't know how to receive from Jesus because they were accustomed to going through the priest and the system of levels of priests to get to the high priest. And the high priest at the time was the only one who was authorized to go into the Holy of Holies. And so once a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and so they had these systems of practices. And so when God in the flesh, Jesus came to, to people, they didn't know how to receive from Jesus because they were so fixed and fixated and focused on this system of religious practices and traditions and routines that God in the flesh was standing right in front of them and they were not able to receive from him because their hearts were conditioned to the religious practices of the day. So Jesus came unto his own and his own received him not. So when Jesus encountered people who were not under the Judaic law, put in the chat, say, I'm not religious. Put in the chat, say, God hates religion. This is why I believe God hates religion because religion, it, it, it causes you to focus on the wrong thing. When Jesus encountered people who were not raised under the system of the Judaic law, like the Roman off, uh, like the royal official today, these were people who just, whose hearts were open to believe. So Jesus could minister to them on a different level. Jesus could just say something and they take it and they received it. They believed it. They walked away like it was already done. And he never encountered that kind of faith amongst the Israelites. These were people, the people not under the Judaic law, were people that were free to receive from God through Jesus without the entanglement of rules. And so put this in the chat. Say, I am free from the rules. I'm free from this, this, this incessant desire to focus on rules-based religion or performance-based religion because I would never be able to receive from God on the level that God wants to bless me if I'm focused on my performance because my if I continue to focus on my performance, the devil is going to tell me that I've disqualified myself, that I'm not good enough, and I'm going to look at myself and I'm, and I'm going to be like, woe is me, and the devil will get me over into guilt and shame and condemnation if I'm focused on performance-based religion. And so it's almost like the people who were conditioned to look at God through the filter of the law, they were so conditioned to be rules-based, they were so conditioned to be performance-based that they could not open up their hearts to the level of what God wanted to do in their lives. There were people that came to God who didn't have that filter. There were people who came to God who didn't have the rules. There were people who came to God who didn't know the 611 rules, the laws of Leviticus. There were people who didn't know any of that. And because they didn't know any of that, they were like, hey, speak the word only. I'll just take you at your word, Mr. Miracle Worker. They were able to, to just believe. So the people that came to God with all of these rules, it's like they had to be deprogrammed so they could be reprogrammed. It's, it's like God had to deliver them from rules and deliver them from themselves. It's like God has to deliver you from yourself, from the limits of your humanity so that you can believe on the level that God wants to bless you. You got to be deprogrammed and then reprogram. And so I've shared with you before that you must decouple, disconnect, and detach your faith from your human performance. This is the only way that your faith will be strong enough to believe God on the level of God's grace towards you. And it is the only way you will be able to do what God has called you to do because when you decouple your faith from your performance, you realize that it's not about you anyway. You realize that it's all about him. It is the father, John 14 and 10, who's living in you. He gives you the words. He performs the work. So it's not about you. It's not about your performance. It's not about the fact that you went off on your cousin. It's not about the fact that you messed up. It's not about the, the fact that you were walking through the airport and you looked at a woman and you, you, know, you thought something you th should not have thought. Lord, please forgive me. I'm sorry. Okay, fine. But that doesn't mean that God can't use you now because you did that. God, God is looking to use you despite you. God is looking to use you despite your performance. You are not good enough. You need to get over it. You're not worthy. You're not worthy today. You're never going to be worthy. It's not about your worth. It's about the fact that Jesus was worthy for you. Until you die to self and the limits of your humanity, you will never open up your heart 
to the level of God's grace. God wants you to, to walk in the fullness of his assignment, but he can't. You, you limit God from moving in your life when you are focused on your performance or your lack of performance. In other words, performance-based religion waters down the grace of God. Performance-based religion waters down God's grace and it limits your faith. Your faith. It puts a limit on your faith. You, it, it limits you to only be only believe on the level of your performance. People who are religious, they only believe on the level that they can perform. And when they do something wrong, they go, mm, now I can't pray like I used to pray. When they do something wrong, they go, Ooh, maybe God is not going to do it now because I messed up. And so they keep watering down the grace of God and they keep limiting their faith based on their performance. And forget your performance. You are, you're not that good. I'm not saying you go sin. If you think that what I'm saying is that grace is a license to sin, then you're not listening to me. You're, you're, you're not reading the Bible. That's not what I'm saying at all. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Of course not. God forbid. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I'm saying is if you are focused on your performance, your performance is just never going to be good enough. So you have to get over yourself. Get over the fact that you're not that good. Put in the chat, I'm not that good. I am not that good. Get over it. Until you get over the fact that you're not that good, then you can't go to the God who is good, who will work through you. Number two, we can learn something from the three Gentiles. It took three strangers to do this, y'all. Three Gentiles who took Jesus at his word. It took strangers, not, not Israelites. It took strangers to just take Jesus at his word. What, there's something that we can learn from these three Gentiles that took Jesus at his word and walked away like it was already done. Let me tell you who the three people are. Number one, the Roman centurion. This man understood authority. He came to Jesus and he's like, Jesus, I understand how authority works. I'm a man under authority and I'm a man in authority. And my level of authority, of authority comes from my level of submission. And because I am under authority, I have to do whatever the people over me, whatever they say, I have to do it. Whatever they tell me to do, I have to do it. Why? Because I'm under their authority. And if I'm under their authority, I am subject to their words. Now I have people that are under my authority and the people that are under my authority, if I say go, they have to go. If I say do, they have to do. Why? Because whatever is under my authority is subject to my words. And so now, Mr. Jesus, I perceive that you have authority over sickness. I don't. Because if I had authority over sickness, I could just speak to the sickness and it would have to go. I don't have authority over sickness, but I believe you do, Mr. To Jesus. So I don't need you to come to my house. My servant is sick. Jesus was ready to go. He's like, no, 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 no. I don't need you to come to my house. I don't need you to come. I just need you to say, I perceive that you have authority over sickness. And so I don't need you to come. I just need you to say, speak the word only and my servant will be healed. Jesus was like, holy moly, what in the world is this? I've never found this kind of faith. No, not in Israel. The Israelites don't believe me on this kind of level. No, they too focus on, he ate something on the Sabbath. They're too focused on, oh, what is he doing over here? Come on, he's breaking the rules. See, these people are focused on the wrong thing. This Roman dude don't know nothing about the rules. He don't know nothing about the law. He don't know nothing about Moses. He don't know nothing about Mount Sinai. He don't know nothing about the Ten Commandments. He just came and said, Lord, hey, listen, I believe that you are the man of God. If you speak the word only, my servant will be healed. Jesus said, go, your servant is healed. And he went home and his servant was healed just like that. Why? Because this man was not religious. And so, so Jesus didn't have to go to his house. He just had to speak the word only. The next woman, uh, the next person is the Syrophoenician woman. And so unlike the Roman, the Roman centurion, his servant was sick. This woman, her daughter was demon possessed. Don't matter. Same situation. This woman came to Jesus and she's like, oh, Mr. Jesus, I just need you to speak a word. Come on over my daughter. He said, no, 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 baby. I'm not here for you. I'm here for the Jews. And you're not a Jew. Your time has not come. It's not right for me to give the children's bread and let it go to the dogs. And so, so she didn't get offended. And she was like, no, even the dogs eat the crumbs that come from the master's table. Come on, Mr. Jesus. I'm not asking for you uh, to do anything. I, I'm not asking for you to go. I'm not asking for a whole lot. I just need you to open up your mouth and speak a word of deliverance over my daughter. She's demon possessed. And so he said, I've never found this kind of faith amongst the Israelites. See, this is a Syrophoenician woman. See, this is a woman that wasn't raised in church. She wasn't raised under the law. She wasn't raised under the, uh, under the rules. And she's willing to take me. I, I offended her and she didn't get offended. She's she just willing to take me. At my, Girl, 
go, your daughter's delivered. And she walked away just like that, like it was already done. Then we come to this man, the one that we've been studying, the, the royal official. This man is part of the Roman Empire. He is part, he's part, he's connected to the royal family. He is connected to the king. He's outside of the Jewish traditions. He is outside of the Jewish law. He's not raised under the law. He don't know anything about the traditions or the practices or the rules or the routines. He just comes and says, my son is lying at the point of death. Come on, man. I need you to come. We're in Galilee. My son is all the way in Capernaum. It's about a day's journey. Can you just come on? I need you to come to my house. Jesus looked at him and was like, mm, I don't know about that. I'm not going all the way to Capernaum. Can you believe? Jesus perceived that he could believe. He said, hey, man, tell you what, go. Your son your son is healed. Just go. Your son is healed. And the guy believed him. Like, I mean, like, holy moly. Like, the Israelites wouldn't do that. The Israelites need to see it right in front of their eyes. The Israelites didn't do that. Why? Because they were religious. This guy just took it. He said, okay, fine. He walked away like it was already done. And he's walking. And the next day, it took him a whole day. And the next day he's walking and a servant is coming from his house. And the servant says, hey, master, your son is healed. <laughs> what time did he get healed? 1 p.m. yesterday. Yup, that's exactly when Jesus said it. I'm talking about this kind of faith. This is a level of faith that doesn't happen when you're religious. Let me give you number three. Man, I said I was going to teach. I, I didn't want to preach, but I'm getting too excited. All right, so number three, let me slow down a little bit. What can we learn from these three occasions, from non-Jews who took Jesus at his word? What can we learn from these three instances? Once again, I've never heard anybody teach on this, never heard anybody talk about this. this is just what I believe the Lord gave me. All right, he highlighted this to me. What can we learn from these three things, these three occasions from these Gentiles? Let me give you a few points as I close. Here's the first one. Religious people focus on religious practices. Religious people focus on human performance. This conditions them, whether consciously or subconsciously, to consider the human that they're dealing with before they receive from God through the human. This is why when Jesus came into his own hometown, they didn't receive him. Why? Because they were like, that's Mary's son. That's Joseph's boy. They were too focused on the human to receive from the God in the human. Religious people, because they're focused on human performance, they think too much about the human in the loop. You got to stop worrying about the human in the loop. Religious people have an easier time receiving from God directly than receiving from God through a human because they always have that because their minds are so conditioned to human performance Then whenever for, for them to receive from God through a human, for example, I, if you're religious and you're listening to me, well, I'm a Dominican kid from Brooklyn. I, 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 I have a master's degree. I have a graduate uh, uh, level of education. I have an advanced vocabulary, but when I'm preaching, I preach like at the eighth grade level. So if you don't like that, if you don't like the way that I talk, like I'm from Brooklyn, you might tune me out. If you, or if you know me personally and I did something that you don't like, you might tune me out. Why? Because you're focused too much on me instead of listening to the God in me. So religious people have an easier time receiving from God directly than receiving from God through another human. Why? Because when it comes to other humans, you can't consider the human. God anoints people to do certain things, but from, for you to receive from God through a human, you have to honor the human in the loop long enough not to stumble over their humanity. It's not about them. For you to receive from the God in them, for you to receive from God in me, is not because I'm perfect, because I'm not. But for you to receive from the God through me, all you have to do is not focus on me and, and honor me enough to not stumble over my humanity. You got to look at the God through me. This is why Jesus was walking around and people were not receiving from him. The Bible says he came into his own and his own received him not, but strangers could receive. Why? Because strangers were not focused on, on rules or performance. G strangers were not looking at the rules. So it, it takes honor for you not to to, to think about or focus on what somebody has done wrong to, in order to receive from the anointing on their lives. If you don't honor the human, then you won't receive from God through the human. Let me give you an example. I've been, I, I'm just going to use like a modern day church example. Let's say that I'm with my pastor, Pastor Tony Brazelton. Uh, uh, let's say that he's my spiritual father. He comes to our church and preaches at our church right here in Virginia, in, in Woodbridge, Virginia. He preaches and the people, I'm like, oh my God, this is good. And I look around and people are like, okay, okay, yeah, amen, whatever, right? And they, they're so accustomed to Pastor Tony. The danger with this is that people get familiar with the human and, and you get so accustomed to somebody that you don't even realize that you're missing out on the anointing on their lives. 
Then Pastor Tony says, hey, man, this afternoon, I got to preach in Richmond. Who, who wants to go with me? And a group of us will go down to Richmond. These people don't know him. And so since they don't know him, it's easier for you to receive from a stranger than it is from somebody that you're too comfortable with. And so since they don't know him, he walks in and he preaches the same message and boom, the power of God is manifested and people are just laying out all over the place. Why? Because they honor the anointing. They're receiving from God because they're not focused on the human in the loop. Let me use my children as an example. Let's say that we're about to go to church and I take my one of my kids, let's say my teenage son, I take his phone. Oh, you, uh, you, he did something I don't like. I'm going to take your phone. And I take his phone. You're grounded. And then we go to church. And my son is in church working on the camera. And I'm preaching the gospel. I'm preaching my heart out. And people are just being healed, delivered, and set free. You think my son is going to be ministered to? No, that joker is going to be like, man, that joker took my phone. And so now he's so upset with the human that he can't receive from the God through the human. I'm saying you can't. This is the problem with this is that religion puts the spotlight on humanity and your human performance. And, and it, it creates people that are either consciously or subconsciously way too focused on the human, the human in the loop. So your heart has to be open to receive from God. At the end of the day, this boils down to this, God's grace and our faith. God does everything that he does by grace. Grace is unearned, unmerited, undeserved. God's part is done. God has already provided the grace for you to become the man or the woman that God called you to be. Now, for you to receive from God and walk in the fullness of your divine assignment, you're going to have to provide faith where God has provided grace. But just like I told you, you have to honor me in order to receive from me. Look at me. You have to learn how to honor yourself. You will never become who God called you to be until you believe what God believes about you. And you can't believe what God believes about you if you keep focusing on your performance because your performance is just not that good. So you got to get to the point where you, deliver, where you are delivered from performance-based religion so that you can open up your heart to the level of God's grace, and then you'll be able to receive from God and walk in the fullness of your divine assignment. Not only do you have to honor you, yourself, you got to honor other people. If I'm preaching and you come to church and, and let's say your wife brought you to church, and you're like, who's this dude? He puts his pant legs on one leg at a time, just like me. He's a, he ain't no better than me. Now, forget it. You, you ain't going to get nothing out the word. Other people are going to get delivered, but you won't because you're too focused on me. You got to stop focusing on the human in the loop. And that's why religious people have a hard time with it because religious people are focused too much on your humanity. I'm teaching you how to live the grace life. It's all about God. It's not about me. I've, taught you, I've already gone too long, but I've given you a lot today. This is one of those messages you might need to listen to again today. And if you get my notes, read the notes, read the notes carefully and prayerfully. I'm telling you what, what I just shared with you, there's levels of revelation to this. All right, let's close this message out with a declaration of faith. I want you to lift up your voice and speak this over your life. Over your life. You ready? Say this. Say, Father, this is a season of refreshing and restoring for me. As I have been learning from the miracles of Jesus, my faith is stirred up. My faith is reignited. My heart is open to receiving from you on another level. I now see how being religious and being performance-based can hinder me from receiving your fullness. So I boldly declare that I die to self to the point where I even die to the limits of my humanity. I yield to you in all things. I'm led by your spirit. Every moment of every day, your grace is on me to do what I was born to do. And I will use my faith to lay hold of your grace. And I will leave a mark in this world that will not easily be erased. Living this way, I know greater is coming for me. I declare this by faith in Jesus name. <laughs> Amen. I don't even know how I got through all of that. This is today's word. Please apply it and prosper. I was meditating on this since yesterday. This is good, man. I'm telling you, this is some good stuff. You, I'm going to listen to this again today. You need to get this down in your heart. You got to be delivered from yourself so that you can be the man or the woman that God has called you to be. I love you. God loves you too. Do me a favor. Leave me some comments in the chat if this message was a blessing to you. And then 
Share this message right now, right now, right now on your social media, on your timeline and with your friends. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. The best is yet to come for you. If you enjoyed this content and you would like to know more about our ministry or you would like to partner with us in what we're doing in the Caribbean, being a blessing to Haitian children in the Dominican Republic, then please go to ripministries.org. You'll be able to find out more information there. And if you'd like to make a donation, all the donations are tax deductible in the United States. A few months ago, the Lord impressed it upon my heart to set up a coaching and mentorship program, and Isabella and I set that up. And so now we make ourselves available on three different levels for those that want access to us and to learn things about maximizing your potential, increasing your personal productivity, and fulfilling your life's purpose. If you're interested in that, go to patreon.com forward slash Rick Pina. And then lastly, we have several books and products on rickpina.co. These are products designed to help you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have apparel there that will help you represent the grace life. Thank you so much for being a blessing to us. And we pray that our ministry will continue to be a blessing to you. 